Good afternoon, everybody. So welcome to Preparing Your Child for Uni webinar, where we're going to be looking at how we can prepare our children and ourselves financially for that university step. I mean, just to set the context, more than 50% of young people now in the UK are going to university because that was a target set by Tony Blair's government about 20 years ago. And last year, you know, we may have thought that uni university applications have actually reduced due to the pandemic, but there are actually just over 1% more applications than the year before. Um, and that's to the 143 universities that we have in the UK. So as we've got more and more young people making that decision to attend university, how can we prepare our children for the financial decisions that that's going to bring? So in this session, we're going to be looking at student finance and what parents are expected to pay, then helping your teenager to budget. Then we'll be going through the right student bank account. Then we'll be looking at accommodation, money saving tips, and then we'll be finishing off about, you know, where you and your child can go for help with finances. And um, before we start, it's just to say that I do have two 21 year olds myself, both girls. Um, one's actually in her final year at Nottingham Uni and the other one's got one more year to go at Loughborough. So although I have, you know, researched this topic a lot, a lot of this is from first hand experience, which I hope to share with you along the way. So usually the first thing on everyone's mind is how are we and our child going to afford to go to university? Because the average tuition fees in England at the moment are sitting at £9,250 a year. And that's without any rent or living costs. So, you know, the question on most parents' mind is, is it really feasible? Can we afford that? So let's start by having a little look at student finance. So there's two main things that you need to pay for when going to university. The first one is the tuition fees and the second one is living costs. And you can apply for student finance to cover both of those things. So we're going to look at both of them, starting with tuition fees. Um, and these actually vary according to the country that you live in. So in England from 2017, the government gave universities the permission to charge British students the maximum tuition fee, which is currently 9,250 a year. Now in Scotland, undergraduate students who normally live in, in Scotland or Europe don't have to pay any tuition fees in the Scottish universities. However, if you go to a Scotland university from anywhere else in the UK, then you still have to pay that 9,250. Welsh universities charge all students the same, uh, with those tuition fees being £9,000 a year. But interestingly, if a Welsh student studies anywhere else in the UK, they only have to pay a third of that and the Welsh government uh, picks up the rest, which is why you see a lot of Welsh students often studying outside of Wales. Um, and lastly, if your child then decides to study in Northern Ireland, again, the tuition fees are the same. Now, because there are so many variations, I found that making sense of it all, the best website to look at is this UCAS website, which I've shown, shown on the slide. That shows you the fees that you're going to pay for tuition, depending on where your child lives and where they want to go to university. Now, if you do decide to use student finance to pay those tuition fees, they are paid directly to the university. And then the student has to pay that back when they're finished. Now, this is arguably the best route to, to go down to, to fund those tuition fees. And I'm going to explain why shortly when we look at how we actually pay back those loans. Now, the other thing that you get student finance for, um, as well as the tuition, is maintenance. And that maintenance is to help with the day to day living costs. Now, with the average student accommodation costing about £100 a week before you throw anything else in, food or anything else like that, the maintenance loan is needed by most people to go to university. Now, for this part, we're going to go on to talk about it. I'm going to be referring mainly to those students from England. Um, but if your student is going to be from Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, then just check out the regional differences on the websites that I've shown here applicable to each of the countries. OK, so maintenance loans then. Well, in England, the maximum maintenance loan is going to be, depend on where the student is living for that year, whether they're at home, whether they're going to be studying in London or whether they're going to be elsewhere in the country. And the amount they're going to get for this maintenance loan is means tested based on family income for the last tax year. So for most students, that family income means their parents' income. 
And the higher the parent's income in the previous tax year, the lower the loan that they're going to be eligible to get from the government. And I've put a website address here for a student calculator. So if you, you know, even if it's a few years off, you and your child can go onto that calculator and have a look at what they might be entitled to receive based on your family income. Now, this is where the interesting bit comes in and is particularly important uh, for us as parents. Because the maintenance loan is means tested, the system assumes that parents are going to fill in the gap between what your child actually receives as that maintenance loan and what the maximum amount is. Yet it doesn't say that anywhere. It doesn't say it on the government website. It doesn't say it on UCAS websites. It's just an implicit parental contribution. Um, and it doesn't say how much you're expected to pay. So for those students whose parents don't know this and don't contribute anything towards their university education, their child is actually going to be worse off at university than maybe friends they've got who have got lower income families and are getting those higher maintenance loans. So let's just have a little look at how that works in practice. So the table on the slide assumes that the student is at university, that they're living away from home and that they're at a university that's outside of London. The figures will change um, and you'll get all of those on the government website if, if the situation is different. But in this situation, as you can see, if the family income uh, combined is less than £25,000, then your child is going to be entitled to the full maintenance loan. And for this tax year, that's 9488 And the parents aren't expected to pay anything. However, as family income rises, that loan reduces. And once family income is above that top threshold of 62286 your child is going to be getting the minimum maintenance loan of 4,422. So in order to make up the money to the amount that would be received by a child whose uh, parent's income is lower, the parental contribution needs to be just over £5,000 a year to put them in a financially uh, equal position. And I found just through my own girls going to uni that generally £5,000 is around the cost of the halls or accommodation for that academic year. So that's what this table shows. It's the implied parental contribution. And that's what it is on the right hand column. The loan that they get then covers the rest. And that loan is paid in three instalments throughout the year in September, January and April. Um, and I know there's been lots of people campaigning to get this parental contribution put out there, make it clearer, put it on the paperwork. But so far, the government have refused to do that. So regardless of how much your child's entitled to, when can they actually apply for this finance? Well, your child can start the application process as soon as they receive a conditional offer from a university. So that's happening now, has been since before Christmas. And they can apply all the way up to nine months after that academic year starts. So for the academic year starting in September, they've got until June 2022 to apply. Now, to apply for the finance, uh, the student must go onto the government website, which I've shown here, and create a login. Then they're going to be asked to fill in their personal details. And at this stage, and I know this from experience, they're going to start asking you questions about your income because they have to be, estimate on that form family income and put in the parents' email addresses as well. Once they've completed their part, that then generates emails to both parents separately, you know, if, if both parents are living together. And then each parent has to click the link to set up their own login and then verify the salary information that the child's given. And what that does is it enables the student finance company to work out the loan that your child is eligible for. Now, even if your family income is above that top threshold, which was just over the £60,000 mark, you know that your child's only going to get the minimum loan. You still need to fill in the, the information to avoid the fact that they, they might not be paid if you don't. Once all that information has been submitted, then the process can take up to eight weeks to process. But in my experience, it normally happens a lot quicker than that. And your child then gets confirmation by email of the annual loan that they're eligible to receive. However, they don't get the money at that point because in order for the tuition and maintenance loans to be released, your child then actually has to register at the university in the first week of term, which normally means actually that they need to take their passport with them so that they can verify their identity. 
The university they go to will tell them where and when they actually need to register to release those loans. And then once they've done that, the money is usually in their account within about a week. However, what that does mean in in normal circumstances is that potentially your child is going to have one or two weeks at university where they haven't got that money. So they might need some money to live on uh, for freshers week uh, and for the first couple of weeks until that money's come in so that it pays for the living expenses that they need. Um, And the other thing to think about is things like accommodation deposits are likely to have to be made in the summer before that loan comes in as well. Now, your child is going to have to go through that application process for every year that they either want a tuition loan or a maintenance loan or both. Um, And the other thing, just a little tip, is that in their final year, the maintenance loan is going to be slightly lower because it takes account of the fact that they should be finished by summer and they can get out to work. So that's the application process for the student finance. Now the important bit, what happens about paying it back? Well, once the child's taken out the loans, they will start to accrue interest. And that interest is RPI plus 3% whilst they're studying. And at the moment, that rate is 5.6%. After they graduate, the interest rate on the loan is going to depend on your child's earnings. But the maximum interest they're going to pay is that RPI plus 3%. But it could be lower than that. Then all students only start repaying from the April after they've left university. So my, you know, one of my kids is finishing the summer. She won't start paying back until next April. And at that point, she'll only start paying 9% of everything she earns above the threshold. And that threshold in this tax year is £27,295 before any tax or deductions. So if your child comes out of uni um, and is employed, those repayments are going to be made automatically through payroll. If your child earns less than that threshold, then they won't be paying anything at all in that tax year. So I just thought we'd go through a couple of examples just to bring it to life. So if your child comes out of uni, they get a graduate job um, and they're earning what's expected to be a graduate salary of between 20 and 25,000 pounds a year, they're not going to be paying anything back at this time for their, their graduate loan, because, sorry, for their student loan, because it's beneath that threshold of 27,295. However, if your child comes out, they're a high flyer, they get a job for £40,000, they will be paying 9% of the difference between that 27,295 and the £40,000 salary that they receive. And that works out at about £95 a month. So it is designed to be affordable depending on the salary they have. And then if your child does start repaying, but then they lose their job or they take time off and they've got no income, then the repayment will stop until such time as their their salary goes up again. Then what happens is this process just continues until either the earlier of 30 years and after 30 years, the loan will just get wiped, irrespective of how much has been paid off or not, um, or it will stop at the point that your child has paid it all off. Now, this is really important. At the moment, only 17% of students in the UK will ever clear their loans and interest before they get wiped at that 30-year mark. And that tends to be people who have consistently earned over £60,000 a year for the majority of their working life. So for the remaining 83% of students, the loan is just a 30-year-long 9% tax on the salary that they earn. So it's not really a debt, it's a tax. Um, And the the other reason that it's more like a tax than a debt is that it is invisible on your child's credit report. And unlike any normal debts that we normally have, there won't be debt collectors at the door if they can't pay. and, And their future houses are not at stake if they don't pay it back either. So it is going to appear really scary seeing that student loan finance statement with really large sums of money to pay. But in reality, it's 9% of earnings over that threshold for 30 years, irrespective of how much you've actually borrowed. So really, many parents could be throwing away thousands of pounds trying to save up and pay for tuition fees and maintenance, because in most cases, the child is never going to pay it back fully 
anyway. You know, I know for my girls as well, this is the other thing I was going to say, them knowing that they've got to pay that 9% back has actually made them think more clearly about whether university is right for them, whether the course they're doing is right. Um, And they're very conscious that it's their money they're spending uh, rather than ours, which I found to be a real positive in that respect. So this brings me on to budgeting then and talking to your child about money, because when they get their loans, they're suddenly going to see a big chunk of money appear in their bank account at the beginning of term. And if they don't know how to budget, it could be gone before all the essential things like food and bills are paid for. We don't need to worry about tuition fees because they are paid directly to the university from the government, from the student finance. So it's only the maintenance loans that are going to be paid into your child's bank account. Now, according to a recent student survey, about one in six students have never, ever budgeted before they get to university. They don't know where to start. So, you know, maybe if you feel that your your child's in that situation because they don't generally get taught this at school, you know, maybe you could use the recording of this webinar to start that conversation if you haven't broached it already. Now, one of the really useful tools I've found is the UCAS budget calculator. Um, With this, you can put in the university they're hoping to go to, and it will show you an average monthly cost of living in that town or city. And it includes everything from the accommodation, the food, the going out. Um, I've put a screenshot of that calculator on the right hand side here, and I I chose Nottingham University, one, because my daughter's there, but two, because in terms of cost, it's about middle of the road. And you'll see that a student at Nottingham normally would spend about £915 a month in terms of living costs. It's also, you know, it's a great tool to go through with a child so they can get a good idea of what they're going to need each month. You know, and then you can talk through, right, out of those costs, how much is going to be paid from their student loan each month, how much they might get from you if you're willing to pay for anything, you know, and then whether they're going to need a job actually to supplement their income. I mean, when my girls uh, finished their GCSEs, one of them started at McDonald's, one of them started at Bills. And the great thing about that is that they're allowed to do that as a holiday job when they come home. So that supplements their income um, and the loans that they get. But they also take on university jobs. And there's quite a few out there. For example, one of them shows students around campus, uh, ones that are hoping to join. And the other one works on a student helpline. And you'll find there's lots of opportunities like that for them to earn a little bit of cash to, to supplement their income if they need need it and I did find you know it really did help to be clear up front about what we would pay for and what we wouldn't Um, and in our particular case our children take their full tuition loan so that pays their fees straight away Um, and they take the maximum loan that they can get for maintenance and then our contribution pays their rent and their textbooks but we've made it really clear if they want anything else they've got to pay for it so that's food going out clothes they've got to make their maintenance loan stretch Um, and if they can't do that then they're going to have to work some more for themselves Um, and in that way we're hoping that they feel that they've got a stake in their own education and think a little bit more clearly about do they really need that you know do they need that new pair of trainers that everybody's getting sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't you know and every family is going to be different Um, so it's just a case of really finding out what works for you financially and practically and what you can talk to your child about. Now, as well as the UCAS calculator showing the average cost of uni, we've also got some printable budget planners on the Better With Money website, which you can download for free. You can use that to add up income, see what their outgoings are going to be, estimate the fun stuff that they're going to need. You know, and they can take that, stick that on their notice board uh, at uni just so that it reminds them of what they need to pay for. It's definitely a balance of of trusting them to act like adults and be responsible with money versus really worrying that they're going to run into debt. Um, But I guess another reason to be open and honest about that money before they go so that they can appreciate the financial impact on them and on you of them going to university. Okay, so once your child knows where their money is coming from, the next thing to think about is which student bank account to opt for. Now, these accounts are designed exclusively for university students. They've got perks like rail cards, interest-free overdrafts, um, but they will need to prove their student status when open the account. So they will need to wait until their uni place is confirmed before they can open it. Now, most student forums and money advice services suggest that you go for an account which offers the biggest interest-free overdraft, just so that your child doesn't end up paying high fees if they do fall into the red. 
It's also worth seeing if there's any worthwhile freebies, things like the student rail cards, or if there's cash uh, for opening. But just be a little bit careful. Don't be blinded by the freebies because actually they could be covering up high interest charges and overdraft charges, things like that. I know the Santander 123 account is still really popular because that gives all full time students um, a four year rail card for free, which is worth about £90. Um, and it also gives a guaranteed £1,500 overdraft in years one to three. Um, the only things you have to have, you have to pay in £500 a term and you have to register for online banking. So that might be worth a look at. But a small tip, though, if your child has is going to open a student bank account, if they've got another account that they've had since, you know, young child or age 11, get them to keep that open as well, because that is actually going to improve their credit rating in the future. The longer you've had a, 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 a bank for, sorry, a, a an account, the better your credit rating is going to be. So it will help them when they want to get things like graduate loans and mortgages when they come out of university. Now, some student bank accounts will also give you a credit card. And again, if you sensibly, this can be a great way of your child building up their credit rating for if they want to buy a house in future. But if they miss repayments, then obviously it's going to have a detrimental effect on their credit rating. So if they are going to use it, suggest to them that they set up a direct debit to make sure that that monthly balance is paid. Um, our girls, they, they use it for their monthly food shop, and then they make sure they've got enough money to pay it off at the end of the month to build that credit history. Another little tip is for them to shop around for bank accounts when they graduate because they might get better savings rates elsewhere. The bank might automatically switch the student account to a graduate account, but it is good to shop around, particularly if they've got a low, low job overdraft and that they might need to start paying fees on. Now, the Save the Student website's got some brilliant information on student finance and bank accounts. So worth looking at that with your child if you want a little bit more. OK, so we've looked at student finance, budgeting and bank accounts. The next important thing to look at is accommodation. And before you and your child start looking at rooms, it is worth working out what you can realistically afford every week or month based on that maintenance loan that they're likely to receive. And now contract lengths for accommodation normally are around 40 weeks. And in halls, you don't normally have to pay during the summer holidays, but you will still need to pay through Christmas and Easter. Now, as you can imagine, accommodation comes in a whole range of shapes and sizes um, and therefore price as well. So halls, for example, they tend to start at around £60 a week for a basic room, but that might be a bus ride away from campus. Um, and they can go all the way through to about £150 a week for a self-contained flat within a student village. Um, and accommodation will be more expensive if you opt for the extras like food included, ensuite bathrooms, cleaners, those sorts of things. But it is also worth seeing whether that price includes any extras like a, a free bus pass around the city or maybe a gym membership as well. Now, when you can apply for university halls does vary from uni to uni, but normally you can start applying once you've accepted an offer. Some universities will allow you to apply for accommodation, even if they're only your insurance option, although, you know, many will only open those applications once it's your firm choice. Now, although you can't apply until you've got your offer um, and it's been confirmed, it is worth doing your research just so that you can make that application as soon as they open, because accommodation is usually allocated on a first come, first served basis. And deadlines for applying for halls is normally in the July or August before the September in which they start. So just check out what the deadline is going to be for the university that your child wants to go to. Just like any private accommodation, a deposit is normally required for university halls. It can be anywhere between 150 and 500 pounds, depending on the university and whether that room is catered or not. That deposit is normally then returned at the end of the year, minus any damages or any outstanding payments that they've got. Once you've secured halls, um, then you can encourage a child to go on to Facebook and search uni name plus the halls name plus the year. And they'll normally find a Facebook group with other students that are going to be in the halls with them. Um, and again, from our experiences, once they've done that, they normally then set up WhatsApp groups and start talking about freshers activities and what they're going to take and all those lovely things, all those important things. 
But it is worth mentioning that not all universities have enough places in halls of residence for all the first year students. So if they don't get halls, then you can look at alternative accommodation. One of the best places to get help with that is the University Housing Office. Um, They can advise on on and off campus accommodation, and they also recommend local letting agents and landlords. Um, You can also look on social media. You know, there's likely to be a Facebook housing group for that uni, um, where also you'll get a feedback from students about landlords. They're very vocal about whether a landlord is good or not. Um, Often though, if you do get private accommodation, the rentals will start in the summer. So you might end up paying longer than if your child went to into halls. Now I found when looking around that the uni guide had some brilliant top tips for accommodation and they look at things like catered versus non-catered. So take a look at that if you want a little bit more about uh, accommodation in general. The other two things I just wanted to mention quickly about accommodation was insurance and TV licenses. If your child is going to be in halls, check your your own home insurance first to see if it covers your child's belongings while they're temporarily away from home. Um, Oh, you know, while they're away during term time. Now, the cover does normally only apply whilst they're in their accommodation as long as they come back to you in those holidays. If your child is in a shared house and contents insurance isn't included, then you might want to consider a separate uh, contents insurance policy. And don't assume that student policies are always going to be cheaper. Shop around, look on comparison websites like Money Supermarket. They're a really good place to start. Um, But also check that your child's gadgets are going to be included. Those laptops, those iPads, those phones. Sometimes it's cheaper to get gadget insurance rather than adding it to the main insurance. You might also want to just register any valuable possessions on Immobilize. This is a free register. It's used by the UK police. And if they find stolen goods, they use this to return the items to their rightful owners. Um, And Money Saving Expert have got a brilliant guide for getting insurance for students that I've put at the bottom there. The other thing I just wanted to mention was TV license, because if your child is going to uni, they're going to need one if they're going to watch live TV or BBC iPlayer on a TV or a laptop, whether they're in halls, whether they're in a shared house. The only time they're not going to need a TV license is if they're only watching a communal uh, TV in a hall. Uh, But as soon as they're watching anything on a personal device and that personal device is plugged in, they're going to need a TV license. Okay, that brings me, we're nearly at the end, onto some final money saving tips to think about in preparation. The first one is council tax. So full time students do not need to pay council tax, and halls of residence are normally exempt dwellings anyway. Um, but your child should remain exempt from council tax, even if they do a placement year in, in the middle, provided the total time they spent on that work placement doesn't exceed the combined periods of study. Next thing to think about is free prescriptions. Once they reach the age of 19, they can go on to the NHS low income scheme using the HC2 form. um, And you'll find that on the NHS England website. Um, And the same process applies for dental treatment and sight tests. Now, if your child goes to university in Scotland, Northern Ireland or Wales, definitely get them to register at the doctors there because the prescriptions in those countries are free anyway. Now, one of the other things, the big upfront costs of uni can be textbooks. So depending on your course your child is doing, rather than buy them all from you, you might want to look at some year long book rentals. So I've put a couple of sites here. You've got Vital Source and Palego. It could actually save you up to 80 percent less than buying the text new. Also consider, sorry, get my words out, consider that 16 to 25 rail card. Costs £70 for three years, um, but it offers a third of all rail travel. So if your child's going to be travelling to uni and back by train or visiting their friends, it could be well worth doing. Next thing is the totem card. Now, this replaced the student's card. Um, It means even if they opt for the free version, they're still going to get discounts in places like Pizza Express and ASOS. If they pay £14.99 a year, they'll get a lot more. And they'll also get the added bonus of a verified proof of age card so they don't have to start carrying around their driving license or their passport. Um, And they can get that totem card from age 16. There's also a student discount card um, at uni days, free to use, and it gives students a range of ongoing uh, discounts from Apple, Domino Pizzas, Admiral Insurance. Um, But finally, get them to look at Save the Student website, loads of money saving advice, loads of tips on how to get cheap tickets and cutting money on food. Um, So that is well worth a look. 
Now, student finance and help, um, it, there's been a recent survey that shows about 79% of students worry about making ends meet. So there is a few places that students can go for help with finance and debt. Um, first of all, it's worth looking at the government web website, which does highlight the help available. And I've put the address at the top there. But also think about speaking to student services at the university that your child goes to to see if they've got any grants, loans or bursaries that they might be entitled to to help them through. And a lot of universities can also give your child free financial advice um, arranged through the National Association of Student Money Advisors. So, again, look out for that to see if that's that's there. Um, and the other one I wanted to mention is Turn to Us, because that's a national charity that helps people financially when things get tough. Not only do they offer support themselves, but they've got a grants checker. You put in your details on their website and it tells you whether there's any grants available for students in that area. Um, and lastly, loads of info on the Step Change website about student advice on debt. Um, so I've included the website there. And of course, please don't forget the fantastic services offered by the ICE BEM Fund and Support Network who have sponsored this webinar today. If you want more information on the support they can provide, take a look at their websites or contact them on the helpline shown. Now, just to finish off, I've put some of the useful websites that I've mentioned here, you know, and I think really the key is to start that conversation about money. So it's one less thing for you and your child to worry about when they get there and they start that uni experience.